hope he wasn't saying anything bad about us. <laughs> Maybe I really know Portuguese really well. I'm just <laughs> pretending. Uh, yeah, ready to go? All right, that's us. So I'm Karen, and uh, I am a happiness engineer on the happiness hiring team at Automatic. I've worked at Automatic for three years, and I have been hiring happiness engineers for two years. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows what a happiness engineer is exactly. A <laughs> uh, happiness engineer is someone who does support for WordPress.com or any other company. You will hear happiness engineer here and there at other companies, happiness heroes. There's, there's some other happiness people. Anyway, we help make people happy with our product. Uh, I live in New Mexico. I don't know if anybody knows uh, anything about Breaking Bad. Uh, the city that I live in, Albuquerque, uh, is not like the city that you see in Breaking Bad. It is very, very nice there. Um, so, every once in a while people do meth, but, you know. Uh, this is my first time in Brazil, and we're very honored to be here. I'm Erica, if you haven't gathered that. Um, also my first time in Brazil. Um, again, also really happy to be here, so thank you guys. Um, I work with Karin on the happiness hiring team. Oh, I think someone just turned that up, thank you. Um, I work with Karin on the happiness hiring team, uh, helping hire happiness engineers. Uh, right now I'm, I'm doing a support rota or a rotation with the Woo Themes team as well, providing support um, for their customers. So uh, I've been at Automatic for about four years doing support ranging from email to live chat to even a little bit of phone support. Um, so I've kind of done a whole gamut. And uh, I live in New Jersey, so I guess if I have to go with TV shows that make our s place of origin look bad, I can say The Sopranos. Um, so, uh, and again, this is, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. So that's, that's me and, and Karen. So that's us. Yeah. Uh, so before we talk about uh, how to do support as a developer or a theme author or a web designer, um, we want to talk a little bit about how we do support at Automatic. Uh, at Automatic, everyone who works anywhere in the company, from finance to developer, everybody, spends three weeks in our support areas. Uh, whether they have used WordPress before or not, they help users of WordPress. And the reason that they do that is that it is very important for us to have everyone who works at Automatic, who works on WordPress.com or any of our products, to really understand the users and to know how our culture works. And the best way to do that is from within the happiness team. Uh, to learn from the support people. Uh, so we do, our, our teams are split up. The, the happiness team is split up into three, uh, they, they work on support in three areas. We do email, we do live chat, and um, we also do public forums. Uh, the various teams are split up into product areas. So we have teams that support Jetpack or Kismet or WordPress.com general usage, uh, the, the woo areas, all of that. Uh, one of the things that we've learned as a result of the three-week support process is that even people who come into support and do not like it, they, uh, or think that they're bad at it, they leave knowing that they can do this. These things are teachable. It is possible for anyone to learn how to support uh, a user of your product. Um, and then once we let people go back to their areas, 100% satisfied with their experience in happiness, uh, they have to come back every year for one week to remember, again, 
the things that they learned while they were in happiness. So that's how we do uh, support at Automatic. And um, before we dive into how to do support, um, I wanted to mention uh, a little bit why we're here and, and also how that relates to our support philosophy at Automatic. Um, we try to experiment a lot with support. Um, you, when I first started four years ago, we only did email and forums, uh, was how people could contact us and get help. And since then, we've expanded to trying different things. Um, we're always working towards trying to create new experiences for our users who need help that makes it easier for them or um, is just a better experience for them when they do have a question and need to come to us. Uh, so part of what we're doing right now, what we're trying to focus on is uh, localization. And at the moment, if someone comes to us with a question, uh, we provide support in English. And we have a lot of people from a lot of different countries, of course, because so many people are using WordPress and WordPress.com, that we, have to, we often have to say, you know, I'm sorry that we can't provide support in your language. I'm happy to help in English and use different tools like Google Translate to kind of meet in the middle. Um, what we're trying to focus on now is localizing support to Brazilian Portuguese uh, so that if someone is on, their, uh, is on the, uh, their dashboard and they have a question and they see the live chat form pop up, they can and ask their question in Portuguese. We'll have someone there happy to help, same language. So overall, just you know, that kind of that seamless experience of you know, you're coming for help and, and you get that in your native language. Um, and part of why we wanted to do that, start with Brazil, since you know, we could pick any country, any language. Um, we have, it's obviously, there's a wonderful community here that's very, very active. Um, just statistically outside of, yes, you, exactly. <laughs> um, outside of uh, WordPress, um, I th there was a statistic that we had that I think 77% of Brazilians visit a blog uh, monthly or daily. And it's um, just, the, I think, the second most active uh, out of the whole world. So uh, you guys use the internet a lot, <laughs> and, uh, which is a good thing. And then you know, beyond that, just within WordPress, you, know, you have meetups, word camps, um, translations, everything like that. It's such a great community. So we wanted to engineer, engineer happiness, essentially, by, by providing support um, in a local, uh, localized experience. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys have a very well-coordinated community, is what we uh, discovered, which is amazing, so good job. Uh, so obviously support matters. I think support matters, um, but we'll explain to you why we think great support matters. So for example, let's say you create a plugin, a website, um, a theme, whatever WordPress thing that you're working on, you spend months brainstorming, planning, putting it together, coding it, you're finally done with that creative process. Is it finished? Are you done, really, really done? No, you're not. Because now people are going to use your product. And people don't always understand how to use your product, even though you did it really well and made no mistakes and there's no bugs. Um, people will be confused and they won't understand how you know, to go about it. Uh, so your job isn't done. You or somebody else needs to support those people and answer their questions. Uh, so basically what it comes down to after you're done with the fun part is the other fun part, um, which is your? So why you need great support is because customers. Uh, when you make a product, if you're making a plug-in, a theme, what have you, uh, hopefully the goal is for people to use it. And uh, you know, as long as people are using your product, like Karin said, they're gonna run into questions whether they find a bug, whether they want a new feature, whether they're not sure how to use it, um, or they wanna see if there's something that you could potentially add. Um, they're going to run into all of the edge cases that maybe you didn't think of or they're using it in this specific way that they're going to come to you for help because you are the expert on your product. Um, and if someone comes to you for help for support and either the support's really bad, it, doesn't, it takes too long, it's, there's no support at all, they're probably going to look elsewhere. Um, by the time someone's coming to you for help, 
they're running into a problem with the product that it could be blocking it for them, that they can't use it to the full extent. Um, and if they can't use your product the way they need to, then they're going to go elsewhere. And without customers, without building a loyal base, your product uh, won't get used as much. And, and it's harder to, um, as if people know that you're not going to respond, they might not keep using the same thing or they're going to look around, see what else is available to them. Um, so providing good support gives you longevity. It'll build you that base so you can continue to expand over time uh, and, and gain a really good reputation too for um, providing good support, providing good products and everything like that. Um, and, and as an example, I think everyone, um, we've all had experiences of good and bad support. Um, I know for me, when I think of bad support, I think everyone kind of thinks of like just these huge call centers where no one can actually answer your question and you know, you get transferred to another person and you say the same problem maybe 10 times and you're just like, does anyone talk to each other here? Um, I had an experience like that recently with my, um, my internet service provider where they were basically asking me to prove that I didn't receive something and I was like, how, how do you do that? How do I prove that I, I didn't get something? Um, and it took a long time to actually get the issue resolved and it was very frustrating. Um, Whereas there's a book, as an example of a good customer service, a book we often recommend is called uh, Exceptional Service, Exceptional Profit. And they use the example of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, uh, which is a, a nice, fancy hotel chain. And they would keep notes on their customers so that when people came back, they remembered their preferences. And I think it's really easy, um, especially if it's a big company, if your product's really big, it's easy for people to feel like just a number, like they don't matter. So if they do leave, you're not gonna care is essentially what comes across to them. Um, but with this example of the hotel, by remembering people's preferences, they felt like a unique individual. They felt like their business there mattered. And as long as their business mattered, they're gonna keep coming back and remain loyal to that hotel, which is gonna keep them in business for a longer time. So, so we've been doing support between uh, Erica and me for seven years. Well, more than that, if you count the things we did before we started at Automatic. Um, so it's easy for us. There's a lot of things that we just do without thinking about it. Um, but we realize that that's not the case for everybody. And one of the things that we learned very early on is that it's important to get into the right frame of mind to be able to do support. So we want to talk to you here today, before we get into the tips of how to actually do good support, we want to talk about three ways that we have discovered that you can get into the frame of mind so that you feel prepared and ready to help your customers. So these are our three tips for getting into the right frame of mind. Um, you know, the first uh, is caring about the issue that your users need support for. for. Um, Whenever I've told people that I want to get into, learn how to write code or develop, they always say, find something that you need, and then you'll have a reason to build it, and it's, an easier, it's easier to get involved that way. But I think with any plugin or anything that you're working on, there's a reason you got involved, whether you were making a plugin because you needed that for yourself, um, or just because it's a really interesting product and, or an interesting project, and it's going to help you grow. Um, so when you start working on support, Remember the reason why you got started, and, um, and keeping that in mind can help you to continue to care about the issues that your customers are coming to you with, because you know, people, we are people, and people write code, and since we're human, we're going to make some mistakes. So um, it would be awesome if everything could come out perfect, but it doesn't. So uh, you know, just uh, remembering that you, you put this out there for people, and you want them to have the best experience possible. Um, the second one, I think when getting started with support, it can feel like, okay, well now I have to do nine to five, like I'm trapped to my desk, I'm, this is gonna be awful for the next you know, eight hours. But you don't have to do that. You know, you, support is, getting, is you communicating with your customers. So you have to do it in a way that fits your lifestyle and the way you work best. Uh, so if you're not a morning person, there's no reason to answer a support thread at six o'clock in the morning right when you wake up. You know, if it works better for you to have breakfast, you work a little bit on another product or project that you're working on, you go for a run, you have lunch, and then you're in the right frame of mind to start uh, answering people's questions. 
people are going to tell when you're in the right mindset and the experience is going to be a lot more positive for you as well. So you're in control of your own schedule and when you want to provide support to your customers because it's the main thing is just that you're communicating with people. Um, and lastly, kind of the same thing when it comes back to that call center of being transferred and saying the same story 10 times over and over. A lot of the times the main problem there is that the person you're talking to isn't empowered to actually fix your problem. So if you are starting to provide support and you have people that are working with you, make sure that everyone that's working with your customers is able to actually fix the problems. Um, so if someone comes to us on WordPress.com, if they need a refund or they weren't happy with their product, every single one of us can provide a refund right away. Um, everyone at the company is empowered to, to make a decision that we think is going to make the customer happier and make their experience with our support team happier. And because everyone can do it, we never have that awkward, you know, well, I'm going to transfer you here and I'm going to transfer you there. It's done in one seamless interaction that hopefully makes it a lot more positive for the person that you're talking to. The other thing to keep in mind there is that um, if you're in a position, we're talking a lot about you actually doing support, but for a lot of you, you might be in a, in a position to be setting up support teams for other, you know, for the product that you're working on. So these things are really important to keep in mind to, to put in place for your, for the people that you have working on stuff because you're gonna have a team of people who are much happier and much more prepared to do a good job. So we're finally at the point where we wanna talk to you about the six very simple things that you can do to do great support. Like Erica mentioned, you, if, as long as you've got a team, as long as you or your team are in a position to do the three things to get into the mindset of being, you know, doing great support, then you're ready to get started with those tips. Take it away. Our first one. Um, so everyone was a beginner at some point. And people who are coming to you, your clients, your customers, they're going to be at all different levels in terms of their experience with WordPress, with the product of yours that they're using. Um, so don't assume that everyone has the same knowledge as you. Um, as you enter each support interaction, it's, it's an ongoing uh, assessment of what someone else's level is and how you can best communicate with them the information that we need. Um, and we had an example that uh, at, some, at one point a person had wrote, written in to us uh, asking a question about their WordPress.com site and we weren't clear on what the issue was and we needed some more information, so we asked her to pr provide a screenshot so we could get a better idea of how things looked on her end because we weren't seeing the same thing. And so we got an email back from this person who had taken a picture of their computer screen. Um, so it wasn't actually a screenshot, it was a picture of the screen of their computer. Um, and it's funny looking back on because you're like, you know, what, why would you send a picture of your computer? Um, but to her, that's what a screenshot was. And where we had failed was that we, we assumed that she knew what that was. We didn't provide that basic knowledge. Because um, at one point, you know, whenever I probably didn't know what a screenshot was. So, you know, there's, there's always that ongoing issue of making sure that you're meeting your users where they're at in terms of the knowledge giving them that basic information so they're empowered to actually give you the information that you need to help them. So when providing support, make sure that you never assume and, and always provide the basics so that you can continue to educate. It's, it's not just the question, but always an education in, in the, using the web and internet in general, and then going from there. Some of the people who use WordPress.com are really highly technical. They're doing some really amazing things with WordPress.com. Um, but some of the people that use WordPress.com are not very technical at all. Uh, and one day we had somebody ask us, how do you put the links up there on their website? And we were like, the links, hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the blog roll? I, I don't know. I mean, we were trying to figure out what the actual question was so we could ac actually answer that and give a, an answer that would help. So we finally discovered that how do I put the links up there was how do I create a menu and put it at the top of my website? Wow. So I don't tell that story to make fun of this person because poor thing, how, they, they didn't know, 
they didn't know. You know, like Erica has mentioned, there was a time when we didn't know anything either. Uh, we've all learned this as we go along, but it just is to really remind you that it is so important to first take a minute and translate whatever you're hearing, figure out what it actually means so that you can give a precise actual question that is really going to help them and move them forward in their process. So three, three seems pretty straightforward. Um, give an accurate answer and an, accu an accurate estimate. You know, I think everyone, we, we do that day to day. If someone says, um, you know, what time are you getting here? You say at 3 p.m., hopefully you get there around 3 p.m. But we all know that sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, for someone who's contacting you uh, with a question about your product or service, um, their website might be their livelihood. It, it might be the main thing that they're working on day to day. It could be their job. And this issue could be so central to their to-do list. Um, whereas for you, you're removed because you have other items on your to-do list too. You're working on other things. Um, but when your customers are coming to you, that's really important for them, whatever their question may be. That's an important issue in their life. Um, so by the time someone contacts you, especially if there's a problem or if they're trying to get something to work or they need help some setting something up, uh, usually they've tried everything that they know already. Um, if they know, you know how to clear their cash or if they've, you know, some people, a lot of people are like, I restarted my computer, it's still not working. Because that's, that's the step that they know how to do. And uh, for issues that need more troubleshooting, by the time someone's talked to you, they're talking to you, they've spent all this time trying to fix it, all of this time trying to set something up, and then they're waiting for a reply. And then if we say something like, oh, that's weird, I need to look into it, they're still waiting again. And for them, it's just like, when is this going to get fixed? I need to take care of this. You know, my, my boss wants it next week or something like that. And, um, and there's nothing worse than when someone says, I will reply to you tomorrow, and then it takes a week. Because you're just wondering, like, did they forget? Do I email again? You know, there's, there's a lot of tension there, and it gets frustrating, and then they get frustrated. Um, but if you reply and you say, I, will, I need some time to look into this, it's going to take me about a week and I'll get back to you, then that person knows what to expect. They've set their expectations accordingly, they can provide information to other people, um, and, and adjust according to that. Um, and it's also, they feel respected because they feel like you're being honest with them. And we have a phrase that we like to use called under promise and over deliver. So you might say it's going to take me a week to look into this because it's complicated. And then you're back within the next day and that's a great experience for the person because it's not what they were expecting. And people would usually rather wait to have the correct answer than to have an answer that's not going to help them because they're still just going to come back. So it's important to give yourself the time you need to look into whatever the issue is and then reply back with an accurate answer. Um, so if, if someone writes into you and you say, eh, well, I think this would work, you can try that, and you don't really look into the issue, and then what you suggest it doesn't work, they're still going to write back. So it's still taking that time. So if it's help for, helpful for you, if it's going to give you a chance to really dig into what they're working on, then they'll be, they're just happy to know that, you're, that they're being heard, that they're being listened to, and then that's one less step. They have the information they need to fix it, and they're good to go from there. So number four deals with being prompt um, and, and avoiding long back and forths. This is, these are all sort of related, so we're kind of going back a little bit to what Erica said, but um, you're, it's important to remember that your customer is in pain now, right? And like Erica said, they've been working on this for a long time before they finally give up and ask you for help. So um, it's, it's really important to so let's say you imagine, imagine you're working at a, at a customer counter, so at a store, right? You have a big long line of people waiting there. You're not going to go and pick and choose and go help the fourth person in line because they're yelling louder. You're going to you know, help everybody stay calm and help one person after another until you've cleared through your line. Now, if somebody in the back of the line yells, Obviously, you're going to go help that person because they need help right now. And chances are that somebody else is also experiencing whatever it is that they're experiencing. So if somebody is talking to you about a bug, if it's a major deal, you go deal with that. 
then once you've dealt with it, you come back to the line and help everybody and clear them through. Uh, the other thing that it's important to remember to avoid long back and forths. Now, that's not to say that you don't, if you have a user who has a lot of questions, if you have a customer who has a lot of questions for you, you patiently work through each and every one of those questions until they're happy. On the other hand, every once in a while, you might have a customer who wants to get into all sorts of other unrelated things. You know, they're, they're telling you all of the things that bother them about your plugin or your theme or whatever. And at a certain point, it doesn't, it's not helpful anymore. And when it becomes, when it starts to be not helpful, it's okay to wrap that up and send them on their way and ask them to support, you know, to open a new support ticket when they have another question. And keep your promises. This is a good life one. Um, when someone writes in and we say, I need to look into that, I'm, I'm gonna test that a little bit further for you or I'll pass your suggestion on. It's important to actually keep your promises um, when you say that and to follow through. Um, it's when someone writes in and they have that request and, and you say that you're gonna do something for them, it builds a rapport where they know that they can trust you if you follow through with that. And so they know that the next time they come to you with a question or an issue, they can trust that you're really gonna listen to what they're saying and take care of it. Um, and, and going back to you know our other step where we said uh, sometimes you need to take a little extra time to look into something for someone. Um, so if someone has a feature request and you, and you pass that along, and it might take some time for that to be incorporated into the product, um, it's cool to keep a list of, that, of names and, and requests that people have made and then email back to let them know it was added. That's a really cool experience for a customer to hear they made this request, they made this suggestion, and you listened and it's, and it's there now and they contributed in their own way. Um, and, and to do that, you know, we recommend using, finding tools that work for you. Uh, for me, I use Evernote um, just to keep a list and Google Calendar to set reminders. Um, but something else might work for you. But the important thing is to make sure you're tracking the people uh, and, and questions that you're getting that you need to follow up on because when it just dies out and you don't respond, then you miss that opportunity for creating that loyalty and that trust between you and the customer. Um, and I, I read a book once about customer service that suggested imagining that every person that you reply to is your favorite celebrity, um, which is <laughs> it's kind of a funny exercise, but when you think of it, you're like, yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't say that to Jay-Z or something like that. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna treat them with a lot of respect. And so every single person that you talk to they deserve that same respect because it's another human being on the other side of the computer. And every time you do that, you're increasing your customer loyalty and building your business. So the last tip is to meet your users where they are. And there are a number of ways that you can do that. The first thing to remember is to not make your customers work hard to find you. So put your contact form where it's accessible, be available on Facebook, Twitter, wherever they're going to try to reach out to you, respond to them there. The worst thing that you can do in this, in this point is, is to tell them, oh, hi, yeah, at whoever on Twitter, um, can you go to this link and talk to me over there? Why? Just do it right there. And if you don't wanna have the conversation publicly, then go to a DM or something like that. But, but meet them where they are Help them right then, right there. And, and the, the, the nicest thing about this public sort of support is that then other people will benefit from that and they'll see the work that you're doing and see how fantastic your support is and they'll wanna work with you as well. Um, the other thing that you can do, and this is one of the things that we're currently working on, is to meet your customers in their language, right? So we have for a long, long time wanted to do uh, support in the languages of, of the people who are using WordPress.com. It's really, really exciting to think about the kind of user experience that someone is going to have when they don't have to try to speak English or type in English um, when those things may not be as easy for them. Even for someone who does speak a language really well, it's a really amazing experience to have somebody reply to them you know, so in, in their language so that they can relax a little bit. Right? 
But if you take nothing else away from this talk, above all else, just respond to your customers. Every support interaction, every time someone emails in to ask you a question, um, that is the opportunity. <laughs> that is an opportunity to build a connection with them uh, and create a really positive experience. So even in cases where maybe you can't fix their issue, maybe it's just it's not going to work, or you're, you're, you don't have that feature that they're requesting on your roadmap right now, um, they don't have to walk away disappointed. You know, letting, even when you tell someone no, giving them a reason why, doing so respectfully, providing alternatives, and just clearly listening to their question, and then responding sincerely, uh, that's all you need to do to build a positive support experience. Um, knowing that for a customer to know they're being heard and, and know that they can get in touch with you, then they trust your company and they're going to come back and they're going to retain that experience and tell other people about it so that it'll, be, it'll spread via word of mouth and you'll have more people who know that you're someone that they can trust and that they can come to you for reliable information and quality products and services. Yeah, so it's easy. It's super duper easy. <laughs> super duper. Now, you don't have to be perfect at it, though. You don't have to be great. We all start somewhere. You just have to do it. And as long as your users are hearing from you, they're going to be really happy. So um, we are at a point where we are available for questions. Also, if you have questions that you would rather talk to just us about, if you are interested in talking about uh, the happiness engineer jobs that we are hiring for, we would be happy to talk about that. If you have questions about support right now, we're open to take those. Podem fazer a pergunta em português, o Bordoni vai traduzir. Alô, vocês estão me ouvindo? Sim. Bordoni vai traduzir a pergunta para inglês para ela. Okay. Bordoni vai traduzir as perguntas. Perguntas? Vamos lá? Uh, uh, like uh, most people here, I'm, a, I'm not a developer, I'm, I'm a content producer. Uh, and I have to learn a little about uh, HTML and CSS to build my website. So, and uh, I don't usually uh, uh, post uh, something on a forum. I uh, I try to to search to see if, if the answer is already there. So, uh, I was wondering if Automatic uh, has uh, is trying to. I mean, there, there's a lot of content on the WordPress.org uh, WordPress uh, forums and uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, is it, are, do you think about uh, uh, structuring um, this fragmented content around the platform uh, to make uh, for a, uh, a, a person who is just starting uh, to, to at, uh, at your platform to be more accessible É, o que eu perguntei para elas é, é eu, sou, eu não sou um desenvolvedor, eu sou uma pessoa que produz conteúdo, eu sei um pouquinho de HTML, um pouquinho de CSS, e o que eu perguntei foi que existe já muito conteúdo produzido de suporte de, no, no fórum do WordPress.org, no Stack Overflow, é, se eles têm alguma política de tentar estruturar esse conteúdo e disponibilizar para o usuário de uma maneira mais simples de ser encontrada. So I think um, in terms of resources um, at Automatic, I know we're, we do WordPress.com, so we're a little, we're separate from the WordPress.org forums, obviously. Um, but we do, a, we have an editorial team that they've spent a lot of time building general resources for getting started with uh, WordPress.com. And I think it applies to both uh, in terms of, you know, learning how to set up your website and everything like that. So starting from a really basic level. Um, and same with, I think, happiness engineers too. We've, we're, when we, get a, we get a lot of questions about, you know, how do I get started with CSS and things like that? Because, you know, as you get started building your site, you get to that point where it's like, 
okay, now I need to make it mine. I need to tailor it a little bit more. And so you start getting into CSS questions or what plugins should I use and things like that. Um, so that's something that we often field every day we're answering questions. Um, and so I know our team, um, we have some happiness engineers at wordpress.com who um, they really enjoy documentation and so they'll start writing up some tips. So just on the wordpress.com support pages, we have uh, like a guide to basic CSS um, and things like that. So while it won't apply to you know maybe plugins and more advanced stuff like that, um, we do work on building our support resources to include those more general topics of, um, of CSS. So, but in terms of like condensing the, the .org forums and Stack Overflow, um, that's not something that we have really worked on, but I think when we're looking at resources to provide to people in general, we kind of collectively keep them uh, for the WordPress.com users, at least. It sounds to me like a great project that somebody should work on and contribute to the community. <laughs> Só é forçar, gente. Faça uma pergunta em português, porque está sendo filmado, para as pessoas depois no vídeo também entenderem a pergunta. As respostas a gente vai legendar. Então, próxima pergunta. Cadê? Rodá. Rodá. Good evening. Português. Português. Boa tarde. Meu nome é Renato. Eu queria, fazer uma... queria perguntar o seguinte. É, o suporte do WordPress, ele trabalha somente de forma passiva, ou seja, somente para as pessoas que procuram no fórum ou no Stack Overflow, ou vocês também fazem um monitoramento das mídias sociais é, para verificar possibilidades de, de problemas fora do ambiente padrão do usuário de vocês, e vocês vão até esse usuário onde ele está e tentam chamá-lo para o fórum ou para a ferramenta de suporte, para ajudá-lo a resolver o problema. So, happiness engineers are responsible for the WordPress.com forums and the questions that come in directly to us. But we do have people who watch Twitter and Facebook. And some people I know are active in Stack Overflow. Um, that's not strictly a part of our job, but most of us are involved in the community. So we're really interested in helping people in any place that they, uh, that, you know, that they're, where they're asking questions. So we'll even go into, what's the name of the website, Quora? And, and we'll answer questions even about automatic or you know, any, any kind of things. You know, if you look in some of those areas, you'll see the names of happiness engineers. But some of those areas become a little fuzzy whether they're actually our job or not. Sometimes we just do them because we love our job. And sometimes we do them because we're being paid for a particular thing. It depends. Boa tarde, é, o meu nome é Anderson e eu gostaria de saber, no caso, é, vocês falaram sobre o suporte, mas quanto tempo exatamente o profissional é, Engineer Happiness, ele passa é, fazendo esse suporte por dia? Um, all day. All day. 24 7. <laughs> no weekends. <laughs> I, I'm pulling out a lot of accidental song quotes. Um, okay, so I mean, it's a, it's a typical job. So, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, within those eight hours, um, actual direct user support, probably, I don't know, six or seven, depending. You know, if, if you're answering questions and you come upon a bug, sometimes you need to stop answering questions and go figure out what's going on with it. So it might take an hour or two hours or, you know, talking with other teams to figure out what's going on. So then that'll cut back on how many more, you know, tickets or live chats you go do. Um, but the majority of the day is just working with users 
all, all day working back and forth, answering whatever things they need. And, and also that time to, um, like in addition to bugs, maybe you're, for a lot of, I mentioned before, a lot of people are really interested in documentation. So there's times too when, you know, maybe you're answering a lot of tickets about one particular thing and you realize, you know, maybe I can make a suggestion for an improvement, maybe I can make a guide. Um, so those are kind of related to support, but not directly interacting with users that a lot of people will, will spend some time um, and project time on too. Olá, tá ouvindo sim. É, como tem sido o processo de começar a oferecer o suporte localizado e com empolgados vocês estão dentro da Automatic? Do you want to answer that? Sure. I mean, I think yeah, I think we're very excited. We're here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we're very excited. Um, we. Uh, it's something we've talked about for a long time, um, and we obviously we already have happiness engineers all over the world. But in terms of, uh, we've never wanted to start promising, kind of under promise over deliver. We never wanted to start promising support in another language without being able to actually provide it in a good and, and reliable way. So we've had experiences in the past where maybe if someone writes a ticket in, um, they have a question via email and Spanish is their first language and they try going back and forth and it's just, it's really going to be easier for them and make their experience a lot better if someone replies in Spanish. And for example, Karin is fluent in Spanish so she might take over and, and provide that experience, but since you know maybe Karen's on vacation or something like that, we haven't been able to promise. You know, you're always going to get support in Spanish. Um, but with this, wanting to make a concerted effort to localize, um, that's kind of I guess that's part of the process is, you know, wanting to build a team so that we can promise. You know, if you're in Brazil and you need support, you can definitely get support in your uh, primary language. The other issue that we've come up with is that if, for example, I help someone in Spanish, then what if they reply back and I'm not, you know, I've, I'm off or whatever, like Eric, Erica said, I've started a relationship with a user in Spanish and now suddenly they have to speak English to somebody. And it's, you know, it's kind of not fair. So we avoid getting into that situation. Um, but like almost everything that we do at Automatic, this is an experiment. and. Um, you know, so when we're looking at people who are going to provide support in any given language, we want to make sure that those people can also do English really well, because we don't know where this is going to go. It, we might have, you know, dedicated 24/7 Portuguese live chat, or maybe it'll be a couple hours, or who knows. So we need to be really careful that that you know we always maintain sort of that spirit of of experimentation. We often say welcome to the chaos. <laughs> As, yeah, yeah. So trying to, by keeping it open, it, it lets us experiment, like with something like this, but also change if it's needed. Mm -hmm. Did that yeah. answer that fully? Or? <laughs> okay. Só mais uma questãozinha. Tá. Vamos lá. É, vocês são funcionárias da Automatic e trabalham exclusivamente com o WordPress.com. É, o WordPress.com, pelo menos pelo que eu percebi, sempre percebi, eu já participei de meetups e WordCamps desde 2013, é meio que um, duas torcidas separadas. O pessoal no, nos encontros na comunidade quase que se foca quase exclusivamente no WordPress.org. Um, qual é o interesse da Automatic, ela se aproximando do WordPress.org, de onde vocês estão aqui? Ela quer pessoas que falem português para dar suporte no no ponto com ou quer se aproximar de outras maneiras? Um, yeah, that's a great question. 
so I'm going to try to think of a really good answer. Um, let's see. So happiness engineers were created specifically for WordPress.com. So WordPress.org, that's all volunteer, like with everything, the code and the, everything. It's all volunteer. Um, but the happiness engineers at WordPress.com actually work, you know, we work for Automatic. So our focus is doing support for WordPress.com. That's the job that we're paid to do. That being said, it was like the other question here, I forget who had it, that, um, you know, happiness engineers do a lot of work in other areas too, just simply because we are members of the WordPress project. We are members of that community as well. Uh, for example, in Albuquerque, I run, um, I co-organize the, uh, the meetup group there. So I'm working a lot with people who are using self-hosted WordPress. Um, but, but I think also, um, well, actually, we have teams that do support for, for example, Jetpack um, and WooCommerce. So those people are in those public uh, WordPress areas that are not necessarily WordPress.com, but they're helping people with, with their WordPress sites in general, too. So I don't know if that helps. Did that help? <laughs> okay, good. 